military, I'm certainly connected in all sorts of familial ways, and I appreciate all the good work that you all do. In talking with you all this morning, my plan is to share some information for, I hope, a little less than a half an hour, um, and then really want to preserve time for you all to just ask me questions, any questions at all about what I talk about or questions you have about domestic abuse and violence. One of the things that's so tricky about um, this work that we do is that um, every single person I'm sure on this call has some particular uh, understanding of domestic abuse and violence. There may well be folks who are survivors either because this was in the house when you were young and you grew up in that sort of environment or you've had this experience in your relationship or somebody that you care very much about has lived through this or been someone who's been a perpetrator of domestic abuse and violence. And I think that uh, as bystanders, we are as concerned about those who are doing harm to others as those who are being harmed. Because in the end, it really does harm to the whole. So none of us has figured out the right answer to all of this. But what we do know is that if we all work together and we uh, deepen our understanding, um, we can make a difference. We're already making the difference in many people's lives. And so I'm glad to be able to be part of this today to help all of you understand uh, a little more perhaps and, and understand as deeply as possible the resources available to you all as you do your work and move through your lives. So let me start by uh, sharing um, this. Um, this is a painting that my sister did back in the 70s. This is the house I grew up in. I'm from East Chapman, Maine, which uh, is in the county. Marcel and I were talking earlier. Um, this, uh, this painting uh, is one that my mother, my mother never really loved this painting because she said it made the house look cold and uninviting. And I always loved it because it does show the house the way it looked when we came from the barn to the house. And it always looked pretty cold and uninviting. But once you got inside, it was warm and a really lovely place. Uh, I had the privilege of growing up in a household where I always felt loved. I always had what I needed. I was never afraid of anyone in my home. And that's because my parents had both made active choices around that. Um, my dad had grown up in a household in Presque Isle where his father was very abusive to his mother, and he had um, uh, witnessed a lot of violence. And he, he told me a story, which is one of the things that happens when you start doing this kind of work and talking about domestic abuse and violence. Everyone will start telling you their stories. So I knew none of these things until I was an, a young adult in my, in my 20s and started volunteering and doing this work. And my dad said, you know, there was this one day that uh, my brothers and I came home from school. My older brother was 12, I was 10, my little brother was eight. And we came in the front door and there was my dad beating my mother. She was on the ground and we went over and, and my older brother got him around the neck. I got him around the waist and my little brother got him around the leg and we made him stop. And he stood up and he said to us all, well, it's a fine day when a man's sons have to tell him the right way to treat his wife. And my father would always very proudly say, and that's the last time he ever laid a hand on her. To which I responded, when you were looking. Um, and he considered me cynical, but in fact, my mother did uh, affirm that as long as my grandfather lived, he was abusive to my grandmother. He died in his 50s. Um, and my grandmother had 40 peaceful years of life after that. Um, but she loved him very much and would never say a bad word about him. Uh, and if my father had never told that story, none of us really would have known that this was a piece of our history. And uh, my grandfather was very well respected. He was, um, he was a brilliant guy. He had a business, Garland's Auto Electric in Presque Isle. He could fix any small motor. People would bring their 
motors to him from all over the place and he could fix them. He could make things. He was a volunteer fireman. He was the fire chief for a while. Um, they went to church. They were, to all appearances, really a fine family. Uh, but inside that house, there was a lot of pain. But my father and his brothers were determined that that would not be how they would live their lives and managed to find ways to be the best that they could be. And they were not perfect, but they were not abusive to their families. My mother uh, also had a very difficult beginning. Um, she, her parents were uh, not abusive, but in fact, like many very poor families in Aroostook County in the 20s and 30s, uh, they had a really large family. There were a dozen children. And when my grandmother died in childbirth, my mother had to go out and start working when she was 13. She had to leave home and be a hired girl. So when my folks met in high school in Presque Isle, they just, they connected and said, we are going to have a, we are going to create a, a life where we are both happy and caring for each other and we'll raise a, a family. And so they did. Um, and uh, the last day that my mother was alive and at home was their 71st wedding anniversary. So I like to start with that story uh, because um, I have such profound belief in the resilience of human beings and such appreciation for how hard that is and that each person's story is unique. Each person's resources to move through these issues um, are different. And so we can't make assumptions about what anyone has been through or what's possible for them, but we can be empathetic, we can be present, and we can uh, be helpful. So uh, I will move along from that and uh, help, us, help us think through what is this thing that we're talking about and what do we need? Um, first of all, uh, I always like to make some clarifications by offering up a definition of what I'm talking about. And usually when I talk about these things, I talk about domestic abuse or domestic abuse and violence. Because if I just say violence, people focus on physical violence. When in fact, domestic abuse is a pattern of controlling behavior. It is not isolated incidents of physical abuse between which things are fine. Things are not fine. This is a pattern of controlling behavior over the course of time. And it's in the context of a current or former relationship. And, and you know, I, I am confronted every day by the realization that there are things that all of us will tolerate, put up with, that are in our intimate relationships that we would never take from somebody else. And part of that is because part of how we define intimate relationship and family is that we forbear some things, we forgive some things, we tolerate some things and we're patient through things. Those are values that we have. But, and so it can be very hard when they, to draw the line with, no, this is not okay. Just because we're married or just because we're in a family doesn't mean you get to talk to me that way. But we don't get very many lessons in where to draw that line we get a lot of lessons in being forgiving and forbearing. Um, the other component of domestic abuse to understand, and this is perhaps the hardest thing, is that this is purposeful behavior. People are not out of control. And that's part of the struggle we have when people focus on physical violence, because often when we think about the physical violence, we're thinking, and it often looks like the person doing that violence is out of control. They're so rageful and it's, it looks huge and it takes up all the air. But any police officer, and I, there may be some in the, in the group today, will tell a story about having approached a scene where they're responding to a domestic situation and they can hear the screaming and yelling. But as soon as the person who's doing the screaming and yelling becomes aware somebody is watching, they stop. 
they stop and they start trying to take control of who sees what and what story gets told. That's not out of control behavior. That's very much controlled behavior. And that is perhaps the toughest thing for people to really integrate. And it goes along with this idea that domestic abuse and violence is too often perceived as these sort of specific incidents where something goes awry and, and don't understand them as being one of the many tactics used in order to put this person in this position of control in this household, in this relationship, in which what the person doing the abuse gains is that everyone else feels intimidated, threatened, and are always making choices relative to making sure that the abusive person uh, is able to maintain this, this position of power. And it comes from this belief system that abusers have, that they're entitled to be the person in charge of this. And, um, and, they, and they believe they have the right to actually limit people's human and civil rights, their rights to whether or not to have a job, whether or not to have a child, whether or not to go to school, whether or not to wear certain clothes, whether or not to have conversations with certain people, maintain connections with their uh, family and friends all of these things. So when I'm talking about domestic abuse and violence, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, over the course of time, contextualized use of coercive controlling behavior that may include physical violence, but it also may never include physical, physical violence and be incredibly powerful. So I hope that's a, a helpful working definition for folks. Um, I also want to make it clear that people who are impacted by violence can come from all across our demographics, but some are disproportionately impacted. For sure, men are sometimes the victims of domestic abuse and violence, but overwhelmingly women are the, the victims. And this also goes across uh, all the gender spectrum and all, all shapes of intimate committed relationships. And so that's a very important thing for us to remember as well. I have the uh, privilege to sit on Maine's homicide review panel. We review all of the domestic violence homicides in Maine. Some of those are intimate partner homicides. Some are intrafamilial homicides in which adult children are killing their parents and all of that. When we look at the totality of those, um, you know, overwhelmingly, what we're seeing are um, women being the, the victims of intimate partner homicides. Um, and where men are the victims of intimate partner homicides, uh, it is frequently because they are uh, new partners of someone who was abused by a past partner who is not gonna let them go. Um, and sometimes they are also the intimate partner who has been subjected to abuse in the same way that other uh, victims of homicide who are women have been subjected to abuse over time. But this is a very gendered problem for sure. I've put up a bunch of numbers here, mostly to help us understand that um, really in Maine, this is a big problem. We know that, uh, you know, consistently 40 to 50% of our homicides are domestic violence homicides. Our network of domestic violence resource centers every year serves a lot of people. This is an unduplicated number, 14,351 in 2018, for example. Um, and uh, we're helping these people in ways that we'll talk about in more detail in a little bit, but most importantly, we're available 24 hours a day to talk with people and it's free and confidential. Um, and uh, that is a very important resource for folks and helps them find their way to additional supports that they may need. Um, we also have uh, in Maine a tribal specific set of programs. The Wabanaki Women's Coalition is comprised of, of five uh, tribal domestic and sexual violence advocacy centers. The two Passamaquoddy tribes, the Penobscots, the Maliseets, and the Micmacs all have fully uh, realized centers and uh, are able to provide all of the services that we provide 
uh, for Maine uh, in general, but in a in a culturally appropriate and, and tribal specific way. Um, so they're important to know about as well. And the Immigrant Resource Center of Maine uh, is located in Lewiston and serves primarily Yanderscoggin and Cumberland counties. They're a member of our coalition, as well as the Maine Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And they provide culturally specific uh, services for members of the Maine's immigrant and refugee communities um, who are experiencing a variety of forms of gender-based violence. So, um, so I want to, you know, one of the things that we frequently do in this work is, is focus on it from a victim perspective and everything that um, we understand about domestic abuse and violence initially was really based on survivors of domestic abuse and violence telling us their stories and telling us about their experience. Um, but uh, increasingly, what I try to help people begin to understand are these issues from the point of view of the person doing the harm. Because, you know, we've really only been actively trying to end domestic violence in our country since the early 70s. Spruce Run, um, now Partners for Peace in Bangor, was the third organization in the country set up to try to address issues of domestic abuse and violence. And they were founded in 1973. So, um, and I came into this work in 1986 in Maine. Um, and we were really still in a very, very beginning stages of understanding this and, and finding ways to do the work in a way that was um, safe, both for the people doing the work and for survivors trying to escape abuse and violence. But now we are in a place where we have made a lot of progress. There are many services and resources available for victims of abuse and violence, but we're turning our attention increasingly to what can we do to really impact the people who are causing the harm and help them recognize what they're doing, what the impact is, and helping them change the underlying beliefs that lead to their actions that are having this kind of negative impact on the people that they care about and on themselves. Um, so part of what it's important to understand are some of the tactics that we will hear about and experience if we're trying to be helpful or intervene with people who are using violence. So they are masters of control and manipulation. They, where their deepest skill is their ability to move responsibility for what they're doing onto their victim with counter accusations, with justifications that would make one think, well, the victim has provoked some incident to try to take away from the idea that this is an ongoing pattern. Um, they use a lot of tactics to try to do divide and conquer. They do that, especially with children. They'll often create alliances with one or two of the children in the family against another. Stepchildren in families where there's domestic abuse and violence are in particularly vulnerable places and are often targets of abuse and violence. Um, and the other thing is that people who commit uh, domestic abuse and violence um, are very good at making the appearance of change, uh, but not actually make the deep changes that are needed. So making uh, apologies, um, but not really changing the behavior for the long term. And so uh, one of the things that can be really frustrating when you're working with someone who's a victim of abuse is that they will uh, leave a relationship or separate from someone who's abusive and we all start feeling relief and hope for them. And then they'll reconcile. And often that reconciliation follows the abuser making some kind of change or concession that makes the victim feel really hopeful that this time things are really going to be different. And sometimes that happens. Most of the time it doesn't, unless the abuser has really engaged in a process uh, of really deep reflection and really deep change. 
Um, so uh, these are important things to understand. I want to take a few minutes to talk about uh, something that we came to understand more deeply when we did a, a survey in um, 2012. We were uh, very concerned because we started noticing that there were people talking to us about being choked. And we really wanted to know how widespread this was. There was a national movement to recognize how frequently non-fatal strangulation was present in circumstances of abuse and violence. So we started doing a survey through our hotline so that when people were calling our hotline statewide, when it was appropriate in calls, and some calls are crisis and there's lots to do and it's just not appropriate. But sometimes when we were having follow-up calls with people, uh, we would invite them to respond to this survey, which we did. And we were able to talk with um, over a hundred survivors. And we were really stunned to find that 72% of those surveyed said that their intimate partner had strangled, choked, or aggressively put their hands or something else around their throat or neck. And more had said that their partner had done it more than once. And over a third had lost consciousness. And this is very, very troubling. I mean, when you think about, we're serving somewhere around 13,000 adult female victims of domestic abuse and violence, a third of them, uh, we're talking about, is it almost three quarters had experienced strangulation? That's inc that would be incredible. Um, but indeed, it is, an, a, it is a very, very widespread and common practice, and it is extremely dangerous. Um, one of the things that we know is that um, the, the impact of strangulation uh, could be immediate, Someone can be killed in seconds with strangulation, um, but even if they lose consciousness and come back to consciousness, uh, there can be subsequent uh, problems, like it says here, pneumonia, blood clots, um, internal bleeding, and a person or a person's throat actually swelling. And so it's, if you hear of anyone who has been strangled, it's so important that they get medical attention because there can be subsequent impact that can take their life. And the other important thing for us to recognize that if someone strangles their partner, they are incredibly likely to be willing to kill their partner. Whether or not they do, they have demonstrated their ability and their willingness. And so these are things we need to take extremely seriously. Um, we, we know that the impact of domestic abuse and violence is profound. And anyone who is having these kinds of, of complaints and coming to you, these are things to be explored. And another piece that we want to, I always like to talk about, and I talk about this, especially when I'm talking with folks who work with veterans, is that suicidality is a place where we all have a lot of common ground to think about. Um, and uh, because it's so disturbing to know that people are in this kind of desperate place. And what we know about domestic violence homicide is that um, suicidality is, is almost always um, something that the perpetrator of domestic uh, violence homicide has threatened in the past, sometimes made suicide attempts. And in many of the cases, at least half the cases of domestic violence homicide, they're followed immediately by suicide. So the losses are profound. And um, so when we are screening or working with someone who is struggling with suicide, it's really important to be asking about what's going on in their household, how they're getting along with folks, what they've been thinking about, what they've done in the past, to try to find out whether or not there is a context of domestic abuse and violence involved 
um, because I think we this is a this is a this is an integration of approach that has not been really developed yet, although we know that um, suicide is strongly linked with severe domestic abuse and violence. Um, one of the other things that I have had the privilege to do, I'm currently serving on the Attorney General's independent panel to examine the use of deadly force by law enforcement. And I served on an ad hoc panel with the same mission uh, when now Governor uh, Mills was the Attorney General. And one of the things that uh, those of us on the panel came to recognize is that in cases involving the use of deadly force, the individuals who ended up being uh, in circumstances where law enforcement used deadly force against them, there was an acute loss that had just happened or was on their doorstep. That, um, and this issue of loss is so connected with the other thing that we know, which is that where there's domestic violence homicide, it's almost always, 75% of the time, the victim of the homicide has indicated, made clear that they are going to try to end the relationship. And so the perpetrator of domestic abuse and violence has a deep sense of entitlement to maintain this relationship up to and including taking the life of the person who has the audacity to think that they can lead them. And so this period of loss is a place we have to pay really close attention um, and provide support and talk a person through this process of loss um, and what the things are that are available and appropriate for us to do in coping with these kinds of losses because um, it will save lives in the end and alleviate a lot of suffering. Um, if we were live and in a room, I would appreciate being able to do this with you as, a, as an interactive exercise, but I will move us through this quickly, but um, I wanna shift to thinking about survivors as I'm wrapping up here. And, um, and I know that one of the questions that we're always asking is, you know, why doesn't the victim of abuse just leave? And the reason we ask this question is because we're so concerned that if they stay, they might be killed, injured, they could lose their job, the children are impacted, we don't want them to lose their kids. We're worried about all of these things, all of these profound impacts. But what we have to remember is that leaving in and of itself is actually going to increase the chances of them being killed and injured. They may well lose their job. The children are not necessarily any safer. All of these other things remain risks, even if they leave. I remember um, one, one of, you know, all my teachers have been survivors. Uh, and uh, one of them was this woman who came up to me. I, I taught a workshop and she happened to be in the audience and came up to me afterwards and she said, I just needed to come and say to you, thank you so much because your organization saved my life. Um, my five sons and I were in your shelter 25 years ago and wanted you to know that my abuser died this year and we are safe now. She had never reconciled with the abuser. When she came to shelter, she and her sons got a, a new place to live and they lived separately. But throughout his life, this abuser continued to do everything he could to disrupt them, to make them feel afraid, to stalk them and just anything he could do so that they were always on edge until he was gone. And unfortunately, that is the circumstance for some people. Um, fortunately, not for everyone, 
because in fact, what we know is that people successfully manage to extract themselves from abusers every day. And they're able to do that because they manage to come up with strategies that are successful. And it's gonna be different for every person. We refer to this as safety planning. And it's the thing that our organizations are really expert in. We really try to help people identify and strengthen their support system, um, help them connect with people that are meaningful and to really offer our hotlines and support groups to shore up the places where that's appropriate. You know, one of the things that I uh, have also experienced is that a couple of my sisters have, and, and my brother have been in relationships where they were being uh, abused. And um, while I was able to talk with them about that, um, I always encourage them to talk to somebody on a hotline where it's confidential and they can be anonymous because it really affects your relationship with your siblings. If they tell you a bunch of things that you're always going to know, even when they've moved on. And so even though I never bring this stuff up, I'm still this like walking memory bank and it it gets in the way. And so it's really good for us to be able to help refer the people we care about to the professional advocates so that we can preserve our professional or personal relationship with the person we're concerned about. So these things work together. People need family and friends and they can really benefit from advocates. Um, people who are trying to be safe need money and preserving their job can be really key. So having good workplace policies that uh, employees understand about how the workplace can be supportive, with flexible hours and other kinds of benefits, leave time that is described in Maine law, to be able to take time you need to deal with particular issues. Um, but as one survivor, uh, Terry Cruz, who um, you may know he's a Hollywood actor, uh, he tells his personal story of growing up in a household where his father was very abusive to his mother. And he said, y'all just really have to understand how hopeless it feels to be in that place. And in order to heal, in order to be able to really um, develop any kind of reclamation of yourself, you need emotional distance, physical distance, and financial distance. And uh, I think that's a really good summary of where all of us in the lives of survivors can be um, in trying to help them find the way to have emotional distance through their support system, physical distance in whatever way that can best be achieved, and financial distance by being able to maintain their source of income and to perhaps access any kind of financial supports they may not already have. People need a safe place to go. Sometimes that's one of our shelters, but most of the time people don't go to shelter. Uh, they find their way to safety without having to, to take that level of disruption. They may have the abuser removed from the home or go stay with family or go directly from where they're living into another permanent living environment. Protection orders can be very helpful. Um, the police can be helpful. All of these things can be helpful and essential, but none of them would necessarily be helpful or necessary for every person. It's a very unique uh, kind of process. So um, this is where we are. We have the statewide help, uh, helpline number that will connect people with the appropriate organization across the state. Um, and all of these organizations have 24 hour hotlines and access shelter and all of these services that we provide. And this is the map for the Wabanaki Women's Coalition programs that I mentioned earlier. And there are also batter intervention programs uh, all over the state. Um, and we provide technical assistance out of my office to try to help increase the accessibility and the quality of those programs. And we're involved in doing some work to uh, really track the impact of those on the participants and on their families. Because what's important is that really no one but 
the person using abuse can end the abuse. And we as a community are the ones who have to figure out how do we really make that happen? So uh, this is a summary of what people can expect out of reaching out to a domestic violence advocate in our state. Um, we really are experts in what we do and we are free and can talk to people for as long as they need to talk. You don't have to have appointments and all that kind of thing. Um, we work with some people for a brief period of time and sometimes for a long time. So that is pretty much what I intended to cover as my opening remarks. I um, think we have about 10 minutes or so for questions and answers. Um, so I'll uh, stop sharing my screen. The stats that I mentioned about the COVID impact numbers and increased violence, I'll send the report that we put together that I was speaking from. I have a little two-pager I'll send along um, with my uh, slide deck. Francine, I just want to say that was a fantastic presentation. Um, I believe that a lot of the stuff that you did share from that PowerPoint um, were things that I don't think that we think about on a daily basis. Um, and I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd be remiss in wrapping up then if I didn't say I'm wearing purple because it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. People need to get your purple, get your purple going on. Um, if you need purple ribbons or anything, reach out to your local Domestic Violence Resource Center and look for, go to their websites and look for the activities they're doing virtually and support them and, and reach out because um, this is the month when we remember the people we've lost, people who are living through this, and uh, and really recommit to our, our collective efforts. Okay, this will end uh, Francine's, unless someone else has it. Oh, Leo has his hand up. So go ahead, Leo. Or is that an applaud? That's I'm just applauding. No, oh, there. Um, <laughs> but if um, this will definitely end our presentation. Um, if you have no more questions or comments, please feel free to just file out. And Francine and the uh, tech team will stay on until the very end and where everybody is gone. So um, again, everybody just uh, have a great day and thank you for joining us today. Thank you all. Thanks, Francine. Thanks, Marcel. Thank you.